All right, we're back. Thanks, everybody. All right, here we go. All right, so we are sharing screen. You're seeing it. I just popped out of it. What did I just do? All right, I need to hop on over, get a couple more. We're going to go one back. There we go. Okay, so you're seeing that uh, there are bird food. We're seeing that here. Matt, are you seeing my bird food slide? Yes, yes, I am. All right, so one of the things that we started talking about, right, is uh, planting milkweed. You get the, you get monarchs. Well, one of the other things are all these insects, this time of year, everyone is going to start raking up all their leaves, right? And so there's a lot of really good stuff in the leaves, which is a lot of insects that'll be for next year, like ladybugs. Um, uh, I thought I had a slide over here about it, but there'll be another slide in a moment uh, about that. But there's a whole bunch of really fabulous insects that are overwintering in those leaves, um, whether they come down and then nest in those leaves, or they are actually already in a cocoon or a pupae in the leaves, and then they fall off the tree together. So when you rake them, you mulch them, you get rid of next year's um, insects, all those good ones. So... Kids in Nature Day from a couple of years ago. Here's a bunch of kids uh, hugging trees. Some more cute kids hugging trees. And even some more cute kids hugging trees. Got to start them young to love these trees. And what's really neat, if you stop and you look at what's in the bark, it's fabulous. There's a whole bunch of stuff um, hidden and, uh, and camouflaged in, these, uh, in the crevices of this bark. Um, and that was another fun part that we had with these folks. Another thing that's going on this time of year is if you're going to put up an owl box, you want to do that um, right about now. Um, Halloween, by Thanksgiving, you really want to have your owl boxes up in the trees because nesting season will start soon thereafter. And you want them to see the free rent sign that you're going to put up with an owl box. But how funny, um, those birds look so big and then they got these scrawny little legs underneath there, right? I love this picture. I've used this picture for years. I just love it. Okay, so this moth is the picture I thought was going to be after uh, the bird food and leaf, leave the leaf. So these guys, these luna moths are uh, about the size of my palm and they are overwintering in that leaf layer. So um, all those leaves that you can collect from your neighbors today, so, so handily, gently put them in those paper bags. Bring them over to your place and lay them around and make yourself huge piles of it because by midsummer, they'll be, you know, a foot thick. It'll turn into about two inches, three inches thick. It'll all decompose. But by then, all these guys would have popped out in the spring and had a good time. So that's how you invite these guys to your, to your yard. Um, always want to thank our sponsors. We've got some wonderful folks. William Subaru helps us with our Earth Day celebration um, for six, seven, eight years running now. Um, Birdhouse on the Greenway and Wildology uh, as well. There are wonderful shops here in, uh, in uh, Charlotte. And so tonight we have uh, not only a master uh, tech support guy, but also a wonderful entomologist, uh, Matt Bertone, is uh, going to be talking to us. Um, I've got his uh, bio over here on, uh, on my phone. I'm kind of cheating, uh, Matt. So... Uh, not only is he the entomologist and director of the NC State uh, Plant Disease and Insect Clinic, uh, so when you have problems, you're actually getting his knowledge uh, brought to you when you call the uh, Cooperative Extension Program there. Um, but he is also fascinated with uh, creepy crawlies his entire life, and he pursued a career in entomology focusing on evolution, biodiversity, and taxonomy of these organisms. He's also an avid macro photographer, so if you guys are interested in seeing some of his really neat uh, small scale insect pictures, um, there's a bit.ly link. So bit.ly slash Bertone Pics, P-I-C-S, all lowercase. So B-E-R-T-O-N-E-P-I-C-S. Um, so that's a bit.ly uh, link to it. And uh, you get a chance to, uh, to see some of his pictures, this one included. What a fabulous spider. I'm looking forward to uh, you telling us all about this, Matt. So if you want to unmute and, uh, and turn your camera on and share your screen, if, uh, if it'll allow you to, um, then uh, you are more than, uh, more than welcome to go ahead and, uh, and do that now, Matt. Um, 
Let's see if it's going to work. Great. Uh, it should be sharing. Hopefully you all see that. Um, so we are still seeing me. So let me, I'm going to stop sharing. Now we're seeing you. All right. Okay. So hopefully, hopefully everybody else is seeing you uh, as well. Great. And you can hear me all right? Yeah, we hear you. Fantastic. Great. Let's see. Okay. We had one person said a few minutes ago that you weren't seeing the slides, but I'm going to assume that uh, that you're all set there. All right. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, if you're I'm ready, gonna... I can start whenever. You're, you're on. Go ahead, Matt. Thanks. Great. Great. No problem. Um, okay. So, yeah, I'm here tonight. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm here tonight to talk to you about local spiders. Um, and uh, spiders are one of my favorite organisms. I, uh, When I was younger, arachnids were kind of my favorite groups of organisms, scorpions and spiders and all those things. Uh, unfortunately, they are not super economically important, so you can't get a lot of jobs working just on them. Um, so I've moved to insects, which are also really amazing uh, in other ways. But I've always had a fascination with spiders, um, very interesting organisms, uh, and get a lot more hate than they deserve and should be much more respected. So hopefully after this, I'm going to talk to you about some of the local fauna that we have and then um, talk to you about some myths and, and bust some and also maybe not bust some. And then uh, we'll open up for questions. So. Um, what is a spider? Of course, that's the first question. So they are arachnids. Uh, they're a whole group with uh, scorpions and mites and some other uh, types of invertebrates, these arthropods with jointed legs and whatnot, exoskeletons. And there are about 50,000 species in the world uh, known, and there are probably way more uh, that are yet to be discovered. They have four walking pairs of legs uh, and one pair of palps. Uh, you'll see them in a minute, but they're these smaller legs near the mouth. Uh, the mouth parts are modified to bear fangs, uh, and basically all are predators. There's a few known vegetarians, and some take pollen and nectar, but for the most part, they are they're predators, uh, active predators. Um, the male palps are modified for reproduction. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, you usually have eight eyes, uh, and the pattern is diagnostic, although they do vary. Uh, and they're found throughout the world except Antarctica. So basically everywhere in the world you can find, you can see them, um, which may be scary for some people, but hopefully after this talk, uh, you'll have more respect for them and understand that they are not bloodthirsty killers or anything like that, but just a natural part of our ecosystem. So, um, like I said, uh, they have uh, these chelicerae. These are these structures on the mouth parts that make up the mouth parts of arachnids. In uh, scorpions, they're kind of claw-like. In other groups, they're they're different. But in spiders, they are uniquely developed into these fangs. So they have this this basal part, which is the chelicera, and the fang, which is the at the tip, and that's what's used to deliver venom, uh, mostly to prey, but also in defense sometimes. They also have these palps. So these little simple legs. If you see a, a spider, looks like a box. It has boxing gloves it's almost certainly a male. And males have a whole variety of different palps depending on the group. And what they do is they actually fill these with sperm. They don't produce the sperm in their palps, but they fill them with sperm and then they use them to mate with the female. So they actually use the palps to deliver the sperm to the female, uh, which can be a dangerous process in spiders because females can eat the males and females are often bigger than males. Now, as far as size goes, uh, they do range in size. Now, we don't get all these sizes here in North Carolina, but in the world, the largest are the Goliath bird-eating spiders with a 10-inch leg span and about a quarter of a pound in size. Uh, these, species, these specimens can have a, an abdomen the size of a tennis ball uh, to these very tiny spiders that are almost a third of a millimeter long only. Uh, so uh, they do range in size greatly. And like I said, their eye patterns are diagnostic and, and can uh, and can be very quite varied. So this is a really cool drawing uh, that uh, a spider enthusiast and really great, amazing photographer, Thomas Shahan, uh, he's both an artist, a photographer, and a spider enthusiast, and, and even just general uh, arthropod enthusiast, shows the nice diversity of different eyes, eye patterns in different spiders. And, and again, this can be used to help identify them. And as we go through the talk, you can see these different eye patterns, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, which ones uh, signify which types. Now, spiders can live 
for a long time. Uh, they most spiders live for over a year. Some of the black and yellow garden spiders and some of the orb weavers live for only about a year uh, and then they die. Uh, but for instance, recluse spiders uh, live on average about two to three years. Other spiders can live five to 25 years. The oldest spider ever recorded uh, died at the age of 43 uh, and was killed by a wasp, apparently. This was a woman in Australia had been monitoring these uh, trapdoor spiders, and she had known they don't leave their burrow ever. So if the burrow is active, you know it's still there. And basically, she had flagged this one in the 70s, and it then died uh, a few years ago. Um, and it often depends on the species, the temperature, food, activity, et cetera. Now, spiders can't fly, but uh, many spiderlings balloon. Uh, they, they will put out a, a, a very fine strand of, of silk, and it used to be thought that they would take the wind. Uh, but in addition to getting blown by the wind, they also apparently uh, use an electrical charge to repel into the atmosphere. Uh, they actually discovered this a few years ago, that the, the thread, the silk is charged uh, and repels uh, the earth, basically, or I guess the opposite, the earth repels the spider. Uh, they can land a few feet away to hundreds of miles away, uh, and they're often the first colonizers of islands because of this. And atmospheric samples uh, uh, over five kilometers up in the air have collected spiders. So they are flying around when they're tiny. Uh, this isn't large spiders that do that. Uh, they can't do that, obviously. You've got to be a spiderling, a really small thing to do that. Okay, so let's go through some some of the local spiders you might find. So here are some web building spiders. So these spiders typically stay in their web. They hunt prey that's captured. They trap prey in that web and and basically only respond to the prey that's in that web. They're not out looking for things or or, or anything like that. Typically, they have small eyes and are very uh, you know have a very specific type of web that they build. Uh, the orb weavers are the most common, uh, the ones that people notice. This is the classic cog you know wheel or spoke like uh, web that you see in cartoons they are common in gardens and all around the homes and there's lots of different species out there um here's a barn spider in the genus neoscona uh i don't know what this one is i forget but it's a, it's another kind of common orb weaver but you can see they sit in the middle of this kind of these wheel spokes uh of the of the of the web and in fact these spiders spiders produce all different types of silk all spiders produce silk uh some use it only kind of to line burrows or to to uh line egg sacs or to make a little uh carpet in which they shed their skin whereas lots of other spiders use it to actually trap prey and in these orb webs actually some of the strands of silk are sticky and some of them are not and the spiders really know which ones to walk on and so they kind of tiptoe around those those webs now, some familiar big spiders you might see. Uh, this is a young, a juvenile, but here's an older uh, garden spider, a black and yellow garden spider. Uh, there are several species we have here, uh, but this is the most common and conspicuous one. Uh, and in the summer, early summer, midsummer, you might see these tiny ones. And as the late summer and fall come, they've molted into their largest size. These will die. They'll create an egg sac that will overwinter and then die in the fall. Uh, and then next year, their babies will hatch. They'll be tiny. They'll grow up a little bit bigger. And then there'll be these, these massive spiders. But these are all harmless spiders. They're practically blind. They need to be in their web. Uh, you would have to basically grab one and hold it up against your skin and crush it up against your skin to get it to bite you. Uh, they are not aggressive at all. Another interesting orb weaver that we have is called the trash line spider. You'll often see them in the center of the web uh, among all this debris, the food carcasses that they have, and this is a way to camouflage them from predators. Uh, some other orb weavers are the spiny orb weavers and spiny-backed orb weavers, the so spine microthena and the spiny orb weavers. Uh, they're a little bit more hardened, their abdomen, uh, but they're fairly small species, typically smaller than a penny. Uh, then we have some other close relatives called the long-jawed jaw orb weavers. Uh, some are found around homes and gardens, but most of them are associated with the edges of bodies of water. So if you're ever uh, kayaking down a river and you see all these spider webs in the trees near the near the uh, edge of the river, uh, that's probably long-jawed jaw orb weavers. Now, they're called that because the males of many have these really long chelicery and fangs, and they'll actually wrestle each other. Um, the females don't usually have as long jaws, but uh, 
despite being so scary and crazy looking, they are actually harmless. Um, and so they really, again, they're using those jaws to fight each other. They don't bite uh, people, um, especially unprovoked. Another uh, long jawed orb weaver that's really common are the orchard spiders. They often make an orb web that's uh, horizontal and they're really brilliantly green and orange and red and, and opalescent patterned. Uh, really nice spiders, extremely common around North Carolina, all over the place. So if you see a, a greenish, uh, shiny spider, they also have these uh, fringes of hairs on their back leg. It looks like eyelashes. Um, those are harmless. Again, orb weavers, they're going to be eating insects that are just kind of flying around. And again, very common, but very beautiful spiders. Another web spider that you're going to find a lot around homes are the funnel weavers. Uh, these are common around homes and, and bushes, uh, and the webs are basically a very flat sheet with a, a, a tunnel-like retreat for them to go into. And uh, when I was a kid, I used to feed them ants. I would collect ants and drop them on the sheet and then watch them come out and bite it and then run back in and then come out and bite it and, and, then, and then finally grab it and bring it back into the retreat. Um, they're not dangerous. Uh, they are, uh, you know, very common, though. You'll see them a lot in bushes. And it's really interesting, actually, to observe them. They like to sit in those tunnels until they find prey. So if you ever feel like it, you can grab some ants or grab some prey and throw it in there and see what they do. Uh, here's another a couple photos of some. Some of them have really long spinnerets. These spinnerets are the structures that are used to uh, spin silk. The silk uh, comes out as a liquid, and once pulled out of these spigots, uh, it forms different types of silks, uh, sticky or, or very fluffy or all different types, depending on the spider and the situation. Oh, and here's one just sitting in its retreat. Okay, another one that's really group that's really common around homes are the cobweb spiders. Now, I know we call cobwebs, you know, any kind of old web spiders webs in houses, but cobweb spiders are a whole group uh, that uh, typically make haphazard webs that can and can take down large prey. And they're really diverse. There's all different types out there. Uh, common house spiders. Uh, there's another species. Uh, I always confused whether this is a common house spider or not. There's a really close relative uh, in the same genus that puts debris up in its web and it hides in that debris, whereas common house spiders typically don't. But you can see with that potent venom and the, the really strong web, they can take down really large prey, uh, much larger than themselves. Uh, here's a couple, uh, a pair, a male and a female. Um, maybe some of you can tell me which one's the male, and which one's the female. Uh, but these are uh, these are another type of cobweb spider. This uh, these uh, curled a mint leaf uh, in my yard, and they were living underneath. And the female is probably going to produce some eggs soon. Um, but if you, unless I don't know if you've guessed, but this is the male. You can see his palps right there, and he's a little bit thinner. The females typically of uh, spiders are much larger and usually fatter um uh because they're producing eggs they need to, all that nutrition to produce a lot a lot of eggs whereas the males kind of walk around and don't live for very long um and uh you know usually are just there to mate other cobweb spiders uh argarodes or there's uh it's confusion about which type this is but these are called dewdrop spiders but they actually go into the webs of large orb weavers and clip out the prey and steal the prey. So they're called kleptoparasites. They actually steal prey from the bigger spiders. Um, this is a really beautiful therigula. This uh, it almost looks like a little ladybug, but that's a very, very tiny cobweb spider, only a few millimeters long. Uh, there's a group called Uliborid spiders, uh, one of my favorite groups, actually. Someone called them feather-legged feather orb weavers, or they're kind of, or crebelli. Uh, it's really technical. I'm not going to get into that, but um, they have feathery legs uh, and make these horizontal kind of uh, mesh-like webs. But they're really interesting. In they're one of the few spiders that does not have venom. So almost all spiders have a type of venom. Uh, most are not medically important, and most can't even deliver it to people. Uh, but they use this venom, of course, to take down prey. Uh, Ulaborid spiders, on the other hand, though, they basically wrap their prey really tight and compact it, and then they poke holes with their fangs in and vomit all over it to digest it. So they're they're just good little trash compactors that feed on these prey. And some are very common, like this Ulaborus. 
uh, but I was really fortunate uh, a month, a couple months ago to find a triangle spider. Uh, now it's not called a triangle spider because it's triangular in shape, but it's a little ulibor. It's got these weird eye patterns and a lot of the ulibors have weird eye patterns. It's got this really kind of weird comb on its leg. Uh, and you can see it's holding the silk. And this is a really interesting spider in that it only makes a little kind of pizza pie slice of a web. And what it does is it attaches it and then it sits back here and it and it pulls it tight. And what happens is when prey lands in there, it'll let loose and start to kind of uh, let up on the slack that then closes the web around the prey. So really strange. There's even some ulibors that have very few strands and they just sit there and wait for prey to hit it. Really strange group, but one of my favorite groups. Uh, and then the mine that you see here, you can see this ball of, of silk that they're holding kind of tight and then they're gonna let loose of that to, to collapse the web. And this spider is only a few millimeters long. It's not a giant spider or anything like that. Okay, so those are things that use webs. Those are spiders, and that's what spiders are famous for. Uh, but there are also a lot of ambush predators. These sit and wait. Uh, they may be camouflaged, they may be not, but they are going to sit there and wait for prey to come to them. Uh, so lynx spiders are one of the first groups. Uh, active, they can be more active. Some groups like the oxyopes, uh, striped lynx spiders and whatnot. Uh, but many of them are sit and wait uh, predators, uh, especially the green lynx spider. Uh, they have small eyes uh, and very distinct leg spines. Uh, so you can see they're very thorny looking. Um, the green lynx spider uh, is a good mother. She will almost starve to death to protect her egg sac here. This is actually on a tobacco leaf that came into the uh, clinic. But these green lynx spiders often sit on flowers and kind of just wait. And with that green look, and here's a closer up of them, you can see that really distinct eye pattern. Um, they're just sitting there waiting and they look like a piece of foliage. And when a bee or something comes up, uh, you know, fly something, they'll grab it and eat it. Uh, I should I should mention that most spiders are generalist predators, which means they can be beneficial if they're eating pests, but they will also eat beneficial insects like bees and, and whatnot. Um, uh, there are some spiders that are a little bit more specific, and there are also spiders that eat other spiders. Um, crab spiders are another really common group of ambush predator spiders. Uh, they're called crab spiders because their front two pairs of legs are really long and, and large and their hind ones are smaller and they usually grip with their hind ones and use their front legs to grab prey and uh, pierce it with their fangs. They have a pretty potent venom for, for insects and so they can quickly immobilize large prey like this bee. Um, some live in leaf litter but most live on flowers um, and they also have a really funky eye arrangement. And we'll see some other examples here. Here's a small um, one sitting on a flower. This is one of the one leaf litter uh, living ones. They're a lot more dirt colored because of course they're living in the litter. Uh, this one has a really characteristic uh, uh, stance and head and, and it's, a, it's a common genus. Um, and then you get these really interesting ones. Uh, this, this species can actually change colors over time depending on what flowers it's on. So it can be from, uh, uh, white like this to yellow to pink or purple um, and they'll just sit there like that just waiting for prey to come to the flower and then grab it with those front legs. Another ambush predator of course are the trapdoor spiders. We do actually have trapdoor spiders here in North Carolina. Um, you don't see them very often because the females stay in their in their tunnel the whole time and sometimes you will see the males wandering around at certain times of year to go find their mates. Uh, these spiders will mate once as males and then die but the females will mate and produce young uh, throughout their life. Um, Cor this corklid trapdoor spider, Umidia, is often confused for Sydney uh, deadly Sydney funnel web spiders here in North Carolina. People think they've introduced or accidentally introduced. Uh, but if you just look at this leg and see that saddle shape of this leg segment here, you can identify them pretty easily. And they are somewhat common. You can see these are the pedipalps, the palps for the male to use to deliver the sperm. And uh, this is a, we, we see this uh, sometimes crawling around, uh, they'll crawl around looking for a mate, they're kind of aggressive because they're on a mission. Uh, so they'll rear up and stuff and warn you that they're not happy with you kind of messing with them. Uh, the females are typically only found when you're digging in a yard or something like that and you'll uncover a burrow. 
Uh, here's a wafer lib trapdoor spider. Uh, I found one of these while I was trick or treating one year. So they do come out sometimes in the fall and the cooler season. Um, but it's just another type of uh, trapdoor spider that we have locally. Uh, and both of these are about the size of a, um, I would say, uh, a small tarantula, about, like uh, about half the size of a regular tarantula you'd see at a store or something like that. Um, maybe a little bit smaller, about the size of a half dollar. One of my favorite spiders, though, is another kind of trapdoor type spider, relative of tarantulas, uh, called the purse web spider. Now, these have huge chelicery with really long fangs. And what they do is they actually make these silken tubes that go into the ground and often up tree trunks or along the ground. And what they do is they sit inside this silken tube. And when an insect crawls on the tube, they'll actually pierce the tube and grab the insect from the inside and drag it into that tube. Um, I've never seen the tubes myself, although they're around here. Uh, and this was a uh, male, uh, probably out searching for a female that was collected by my friend who was collecting termites and it crawled up on his leg is about the size of a quarter uh not very big honestly and uh, he wasn't scared luckily he was an entomologist so he brought it to me uh and i was really happy to see it because it's one of my favorite groups of spiders just really cool behavior really interesting looking uh and not super commonly seen okay now we're into the hunting spiders these are much more active they're going to be running around uh sensing prey either with eyes or with their touch, and uh, they're going to actively find prey. The most charismatic of those, and I think the most adorable, and most people would agree, are the jumping spiders. Uh, the huge eyes could give you should give you an idea that they do have very good vision, and they are actually very intelligent spiders. Um, they can pounce on prey from a very long distance, and that's why they're called jumping spiders. So they can see them from far away, and they, you know, they can get ready and pounce on them. I say in good intelligence because there are some species in the world that are actually uh, specialists on other spiders. Uh, there's one famous one called Portia, P-O-R-T-I-A, uh, that is a famous spider eater. And what they do is they actually have different strategies for when they hunt different spiders. So they know when they're up against an, a web building spider, which they may actually pretend to be prey and then pounce on it or an active spider where they'll go up behind them and pounce on them. So they're obviously very smart uh, for animals. And honestly, I think that most spiders are fairly intelligent. They're very aware of their surroundings and things like that. No, uh, None more so than jumping spiders though. You can actually see them, they'll look at you. They can't uh, move their eyes, but they can turn their head and you will know when their one's looking at you. Uh, but we have a very large species called the bold jumping spider. Uh, some of these larger jumping spiders are actually even known to eat small lizards and stuff, uh, but generally these jumping spiders are small spiders. Um, here's a couple other species. This is a metacerba. These have these really big front legs and these cute little eyes, I think. And then this is a male hensia, which has these long uh, chelicerian fangs and these stripes and these large front legs. And then uh, one of my favorites ever, this was taken at the North Carolina Arboretum, um, is the Phytopus mystaceus. Uh, the males are this brilliant, these really beautiful colors, reds and yellows. They have these tufts of hair and this really beautiful color. And their chelicery are this aqua or greenish blue color, uh, metallic color. Just really very nice looking spiders and not dangerous at all. Uh, in fact, Thomas Shahan, that guy who did the drawings, this is his favorite group and he'll just get one and and sit with it for a while and let it kind of crawl around and it gets really comfortable with him and then you can get these amazing photos uh, and this is actually one of his favorite species as well uh wolf spiders um they are another really common group of spiders uh if you go out at night and kind of hold a flashlight up to your head, like uh, next to your eyes and look out, if you see a little glittering everywhere, that's probably all spider eyes and mostly wolf spiders. Uh, they're small, large, ferocious hunters, if you're an insect. Uh, the mothers carry their egg sacs and babies for a bit. So uh, wolf spiders are really well known for their eye uh, arrangement. It's very uh, distinct. So they have very two large, two very large eyes in the middle, four, a row of four smaller eyes below that, and then one on each, one small eye behind each of the larger eyes. Um, here's a mother wolf spider carrying her egg sac. So if you see a spider running around with a white egg sac, that's almost certainly going to be a wolf spider. 
Uh, and then if you see a spider carrying babies on her back, that's almost certainly going to be wolf spider as well. So they do that. And uh, they're very good mothers. Um, they're also not dangerous and uh, very common outdoors. Here's a couple other different wolf spiders. Some of these have these kind of pom-poms on their, on their legs or leg warmers almost. Uh, others are pale when they're near beaches. Some are very large and some are smaller. Uh, this is a fairly hefty one too, but you can see that eye arrangement that makes them so distinct. Uh, nursery web and fishing spiders uh, are very similar to wolf spiders. They don't have exactly the right eye arrangement or at least sizes, uh, but there are only a few types around here. Um, they could be called raft spiders and fishing spiders because they're often near water. Um, and uh, they can actually they get large enough to feed on fish and tadpoles and things like that. In fact, they're some of our largest spiders, some of them. Uh, and the nursery web comes from the fact that they'll weave together a bunch of leaves and rear their young in this nursery, like kind of a little daycare. Uh, and so uh, Pissarina is a, is, a, is a really common um, genus, uh, Mira is this one. And uh, but one of the ones that most that people see often and is most kind of alarming because huge are the Dolomites, the fishing spiders. Again, they look like a large uh, wolf spider, but they they don't have the right to, uh, eye arrangement. Um, but they are big. Uh, these are easily the size of the palm of your hand. Um, but just because they're big does not mean they're dangerous or scary or aggressive. These things will run away from you very readily. They do not. They're not wanting to bite. Um, but like I said, they're big enough to eat small vertebrates like tadpoles and fish and small frogs and toads and things. Now, there are a whole bunch of spiders that are called sack, ground, or ghost spiders or all these things. Uh, they're very hard to identify. They're very often very active on the ground or in homes. So they run around on the ground. They'll make sometimes little silken retreats, like little sleeping bags on, on corners of homes or things, but they're not gonna sit in a web and catch prey uh, and they don't sit and wait. They're really active. And so this is a ghost spider, for instance, I think a really beautiful sleek spider, almost like a, like a wildcat uh, type spider. Uh, but they do come in all different forms and sizes and shapes and colors. So Parson spiders are really common in homes. They're dark with this gray stripe down the back. Flat-faced sack spiders are have this really large, shiny red head with these very large, thick legs that are kind of shiny. Uh, there are all these other sack spiders around. There is some, you know, news. The, the people often say in the news that yellow sack spiders, sack spiders are dangerous. Uh, there's really no evidence of that. Uh, they're they're not any more dangerous than the other spider, which is basically not dangerous. And then some of my favorite of the ground or sack spiders are these furotimpus. Fru really tough to uh, to say, but they're really cool because they've got these kind of leg warmers. But I really like how they have these iridescent scales on them. So you can see these shiny gold or shiny purple and gold scales on the on the rump, and uh, they're just really beautiful spiders. Okay, now what might you see around your home? Uh, I already did talk about the funnel weavers. They are common around homes and some cobweb spiders. Uh, but as far as specifics, the American house spider is not actually from this America. It's it's thought to become come from South America. And it's probably one of the most common spiders anywhere, especially here in North Carolina on homes and in homes. It's this mottled color. It's in this uh, irregular web. Um, it's got this large round abdomen. Uh, these are all characteristics that'll help you identify the American house spider. Uh, and relatives of that, these are all cobweb spiders, really common in homes, are, are a couple of these steatoda, which are the false widows, like steatoda grossa here, and steatoda triangulosa, which is the triangle, uh, triangulate co cobweb spider. And you can see little triangles on its back. False widows, of course, look a lot like black widows, uh, but they don't have a red hourglass underneath their belly, uh, so or underneath their abdomen. Uh, but they are very dark looking, very common in homes. I have a lot in my garage and my workshop and places like that. Another group of spiders is really common in homes are the cellar spiders. Uh, most people, most commonly are these very large, uh, you know, their leg span is a couple inches uh, and these they have these elongate bodies. These are called long body cellar spiders, but there are species that are much smaller. Um, you know, these are only a 
the body length is only about a quarter of an inch on this one, um, or probably an eighth of an inch, actually. They're really tiny, uh, short-bodied cellar spiders. Uh, short Cellar spiders are not dangerous. Uh, they will flail around in a web if you come near them. They'll shake their web really uh, violently because they're trying to scare you away. Uh, but they are actually uh, uh, good spiders to have around because they actually hunt other spiders. So they'll go into the webs of other spiders and actually eat those spiders as well. So even they'll be cannibals. So we often get them in our basement a lot. And, you know, when, they'll, when they reproduce, we see a lot of the babies. And then very shortly after, we see very few spiders left because they're all eating each other until the winners are kind of safe and happy in their spots. Uh, wall or star spiders are really cool little spiders. They've got this really, really interesting eye arrangement and they kind of make a star when they sit. Uh, they'll basically, when they find a prey item, they'll run around it really rapidly and wrap it up in, prey, in uh, silk. Uh, but they often sit on, sit on walls on the outside of the house or inside the house, um, and they are harmless. They're very tiny little spiders. The southern house spider is a somewhat common one. Uh, the males and females are a bit different looking. The females are, are darker uh, and velvety. Uh, they often make these mesh-like webs in crevices. They're also sometimes called crevice spiders. Um, and the males are this kind of tan brown. They actually are probably the most similar looking to brown recluses, but I'll talk to you about recluses in a minute. And uh, they are not recluses. They actually have these spines on the legs. They have eight eyes. There's a bunch of different things. Both these are harmless. The males and females are harmless. And I've heard of female uh, southern house spiders living for 15 years or more. So they can be really long-lived spiders. Uh, spinning spiders are one of my favorite groups. Uh, they have this really bulbous head and six eyes arranged in uh, sets, uh, sets of two, three sets of two. Um, and they've got that really bulging head because inside their head are silk glands as well. So they have silk glands that they can use to spin webs from their abdomen, but they also have silk glands in their head that are connected to venom glands. And so using their fangs, they can actually spit out the silk onto prey and it wraps the prey up. So they are not dangerous to humans at all. Uh, and they're one of my favorite spiders just because they're so interesting. They have this really weird kind of behavior and uh, anatomy to allow them to spit on their prey. Okay, uh, finally, let's talk about some medically important spiders. So these are ones that have venom that could be dangerous if it's delivered uh, and in a quantity that, uh, that is important. Um, so the first are the widows, uh, widow spiders. The black widows, um, there are two species in North Carolina, the northern and southern, uh, and they are the largest cobweb spiders. So they are actually a type of cobweb spider. Uh, the adult females are the only potently venomous ones. Now they have a neuromuscular toxin, which means you're in severe pain for a couple days if you get bit by one. Um, I have a friend who was bit by one, and it was basically like the worst flu, severe cold, like body aches, things like that, getting bit by one. Uh, but deaths are really rare uh, and almost unheard of, basically. Uh, they're not aggressive, though. They only bite in defense and usually when a hand or foot is stuck in where they are. So if a spider thinks it's going to die, and this is really for all spiders, if it gets squished against the skin and it thinks it's going to die, it's obviously going to bite. Uh, you would, too, if you were getting squished by some giant. So basically, uh, they even did some studies recently, and they showed that black widows take a lot to even bite. And even when they do bite, many times it's also a dry bite. So really just watch where you're sticking your hands. This is, should go for all spiders and really all things. Don't stick your hands in places you don't know. Uh, tap out your boots and, and uh, shoes that are outdoors, things like that. Uh, here's some of the different uh, stages of the black widow. So the males have, again, those large palps. They're much more colorful, and they are harmless. Uh, the juveniles are also a little bit more patterned uh, than the adults, and they are also harmless. And the adult females have this really bright red hourglass. Actually, all of them do. Um, and adult female black widows may also keep some red on the top of their abdomen. So don't confuse that for some kind of Australian redback spider or anything like that. Uh, in fact, the redback spider of Australia is just a, their type of black widow. Um, but like I said, we have two species of black widows here. Um, I didn't mention, I didn't put it in here, I forgot, but we also have brown widows. So they basically look just like a black widow, except for their uh, 
hourglass is more orange and the body is brownish and mottled. Same shape, same size. Uh, they have spiky egg sacs, so that's what you can tell them. Uh, they're not native to North Carolina, uh, but are found all over the subtropical areas of the world. Um, and luckily, brown widows are not as dangerous as black widows, uh, but they can become very common in people's homes. Uh, this is especially near the beach uh, in North Carolina, but they can get, can be found across the state in, uh, sporadically. Now, the other brown spider that people are afraid of are brown recluses. So recluses are a whole group of spiders in the genus Loxosceles. They also um, have six eyes like the spinning spiders. They're actually really closely related to spinning spiders. Uh, but they're probably one of the most feared spiders, even though they really don't deserve all that fear. Um, and one thing that's really important for this group and for uh, people is that there's a lot of mistakes about, there's a lot of misconceptions about the, this spider. One first thing is not naturally occurring in the Piedmont or Eastern of North Carolina, really only in the Western tip of North Carolina are they native. And even then they're very rare and uncommon. Uh, once you get to Tennessee and especially in uh, places like Arkansas and Missouri, they're very common. They're really very common and native to a central part of the US, but on the coasts, especially the Atlantic coast, you're not gonna really find them. Um, so in North Carolina, you are almost certainly never gonna see a brown recluse. Uh, I've only seen them because people collect them for me or I get the calls about them or somebody knows where they are. But if I told you to go out and find one, you, it would take you years to find one. Populations, however, can establish in a home or building if brought from the native range. We do know of human structures uh, like homes, sheds, barns, even some buildings downtown and in areas that have recluse spiders. And it could either be the brown recluse or there's also even Mediterranean recluses. Uh, things like that, that have basically, they get into a, a home or a structure and start to breed, and they're very happy there, but they never leave that structure. Uh, if they did leave that structure and they spread, we would already have them everywhere, uh, since we know of, of these types of populations for over 40 years now. Um, so basically, if you know you have recluses, you know you do. If you think you have recluses, you almost certainly do not. And they're luckily, they're very easy to identify. Uh, and even if you do have them, bites are very rare. Uh, in fact, one of the houses I went to to collect some spiders uh, was, a, uh, was a faculty member of our department who retired. His parents' house in Cary, uh, they brought them from either Alabama or Tennessee where they were before they came here. And over 40 years, I went into this house and every box you lifted up, you could find one. They were everywhere. And in the 40 years they lived there, nobody had ever gotten bitten. So they are much less scary than people think they are. Now, again, how do you identify a brown recluse? So the best characteristics are first, they have three sets of eyes, just like those spitting spiders, but they have three sets of eyes. So only six total, uh, three pairs. Um, they also often have this violin shape on the, on the, the head, the cephalothorax, but otherwise they don't have any patterns. They're very uniform tan or brown, brownish red or brown. They also don't have any leg spines. So the legs have these velvety hairs, but they don't have any of these spines. And if we go back a second, you can see on some spiders. So the Southern half spider, you can see these thorn-like spines all over the legs. Many spiders have those. You can even see in the female here. But if we go back to the brown recluses, none of them, they won't have those spines like that. So if you can remember those things, that's how you identify a brown recluse. Luckily, they are reclusive. They are uh, timid. They are not aggressive. And again, in North Carolina, you are almost certainly never to see one in your entire life. Okay, a um, couple other things before we get to the myths or just one thing before we get to the myths. So spider conservation. Um, so it's a, they are integral part of the ecosystem. Uh, I hope nobody here wants to kill every spider they see, but and even if they are a little ugly, I think they, they do definitely perform really great uh, benefits to our environment and are just amazing animals anyway. So what you can do to conserve them is maintain a diversity of habitats and plants, the more types of prey, just like the birds uh, that were mentioned earlier, um, and more areas to nest or build webs. Of course, along with uh, what was said in the intro too, minimizing broad spectrum pesticides is really key because spiders will be affected by those pesticides as well. So let's make our spider friends happy. Uh, they are gonna leave you alone, but you gotta also kind of help them out by making your yards more natural, 
um, by not spraying a bunch of things and whatnot. I am assuming this group this is not really something to worry about, but there are certain people that see a spider and they spray it with raid or whatever, um, and uh, or they just fog their entire yard with chemicals just to kill everything. And of course, spiders are going to die as well. Okay, a few spider myths. One, uh, spiders are out to get you. Uh, this is not the case. So there, they did do a study, and as far as biomass, how much spiders' biomass they eat, uh, the world spiders consume somewhere between 400 million and 800 million tons of prey in any given year. They said, so theoretically, they could eat every human on Earth in a year because we weigh less than that. But they are not going to do that. Obviously, you're all sitting here and you're not worried about spiders that much, I hope, uh, because almost all flee humans and avoid them. And most are nocturnal, so they avoid humans anyway. Spiders are not happy to bite people. They only do so in defense uh, when they feel like their life is threatened. They don't run at you and bite. They don't think you're food, obviously. Um, and no spiders prey on people or drink their blood. I should say directly, because they've actually found a jumping spider that preferentially feeds on mosquitoes that have fed on blood. So they do it indirectly. So that mosquito already got your blood and that spider's going to eat it now. Uh, but that's a very weird kind of special case. Okay, myth two, spiders will lay eggs in your skin, ear, or brain. Uh, this is not at all uh, uh, true. Spiders don't even have a way to insert eggs into your skin. So even if they wanted to, they can't do it. So this just does not happen. So there's this famous myth about a swelling on a girl's cheek breaks open and all these spiders, hundreds of spiders come out. Impossible. With that, too... Uh, there's a story tourist wakes up wakes to find strange red trail on his stomach and discovers a spider's burrow through his appendix scar crawled under his skin while on holiday in bali completely false spiders are really delicate animals in fact uh one of the most interesting facts about spiders is they have muscles to contract their legs to sort of bring their legs toward their body but they actually use fluid pressure to stretch their legs out so if you were to rupture a spider, and spiders are really soft, they're not crunchy like beetles or things like that. If you rupture a spider, they lose that pressure and they will die. That's why if you have a pet tarantula or spider or something like that, and you drop it, it can actually kill the spider very easily because they're very fragile and delicate. So there's no way a spider could burrow into your skin. It would become mush as soon as you even tried to start doing that. And again, it's impossible. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so anything that you think of that way, they don't, they don't do. Spider myth three, you swallow X numbers of spiders each year while you're sleeping. Uh, no. Spiders can perceive vibrations very well. We breathe, snore, rustle while we're sleeping, so they're going to avoid us. Uh, one question is, would you crawl into the mouth of a sleeping giant? Why would a spider? It's dumb, and they wouldn't do that because, like I said, spiders are smart. Uh, also, it's not, while it's not impossible, it's very, very unlikely to happen to you at all, let alone X times per year. And more likely you would wake up to a spider on your face or in your mouth, uh, especially any spider that you would not want to eat. Um, but really, it's just a myth. They, there's no evidence of spiders crawling into people's mouths or people swallowing a certain number of every year. So don't worry about that. No, myth number four, deadly spiders are coming in on bananas. Uh, this is my friend Gil, who's another great photographer and spider lover. He did this as a funny picture. Uh, this is actually a very dangerous spider, but it's actually the shed skin of a dangerous spider. And it's a dangerous spider he keeps as a pet because he loves spiders. Uh, so this is all funny. Out of context, it's a bad picture, of course, and he knows that, but it's uh, just supposed to be fun. So although spiders come on, in on shipments of cargo, including bananas, most spiders encountered are harmless, although sometimes large and menacing looking. And in fact, Rick Vetter... Uh, who's a world expert on brown recluses, wrote with some other folks uh, a key and identif identification guide to spiders found on bananas. And for the most part, they're harmless. They can be very large, uh, but harmless spiders. And the deadly ones are very uncommon uh, on, on, spider on bananas. So don't worry about those. Most large spiders, even though they're large and menacing looking, are harmless. Myth number five, you're never more than X number of feet from a spider at any time. So this could actually be true in certain places. And I would say maybe 10 feet or whatever, 10, 15 feet. 
Uh, most places, I think that's actually probably true. So we did a household study uh, a number of years ago. I think this was published in 2016. And we found that spiders were in 100% of homes, or evidence of spiders was in 100% of homes, oh, sorry, and almost 80% of rooms. So basically, just about every room you're in probably has a spider in it or had it in there. But that should also go show, goes, uh, goes to show that they are not biting people all the time. They are not out to get you. They are trying to live their secret life in you know solitude. And you are just kind of uh, a big animal that lives there with them uh, or vice versa. But, you know, we should share our homes with the spiders. Uh, and they're everywhere outdoors, too. Like I said, if you go out at night, on a warm summer evening, hold a flashlight kind of up next to your eyes, pointing out where your eyes would see, and you look along the ground, if you see a little glitter, it looks like dew, and it's completely dry out, that's almost certainly spider eyes, and you can get up and see them. And I would say, in general, if you have a phobia of spiders, I think the best thing you can do is kind of quietly observe spiders from a safe distance. I mean, there it's not really, there. there's you can get close to them, but I know that some people are afraid to get close, but just observe spiders. They're really interesting. They're not interested in you, and they do some really cool things, and and are you kind of get a little bit more about their personality if you just hang out with them a little bit. And of course, the spiders in your home are not that big uh, and uh, going to eat you in your shower, although we do get a lot of sh shower spiders in our house, and I'm sure other houses. So they're just there. Don't worry about them. Uh, I would be afraid of a spider if it was this big, uh, and I would not want to go near it, because then it, we would be prey. But luckily, there are no spiders that big, and there are no spiders that feed on humans. One final thing, then. Spiders are not the the apex or pinnacle predator or scariest thing ever. In fact, spiders are prey for a lot of other things. Uh, so, for instance, this is a spider wasp. This is a, a wasp that has a potent sting. And what it does is it stings the spider and paralyzes it. Uh, this group in particular, this was out in Western North Carolina. I was sitting drinking a beer with my dad on the porch, and this popped up, and I had to go run and grab my photo, my camera. And uh, this spider is now carrying, or this this wasp is now carrying the spider. Uh, if you notice, it has no legs because that wasp has now clipped off those legs, so it fits nicely in a little mud nest. Uh, and there are many wasps that hunt spiders, and in fact, all the mud daubers you see, all the mud nests you see on structures. They're full of spiders. And those spiders, since the wasps don't have refrigerators, are awake or at least paralyzed. They may be aware or not, but they're in that tube or that mud nest and can't do anything about it. And the baby wasps are then going to eat this fresh spider. So maybe feel bad for the spiders a little bit. Here's a yellow jacket that just grabbed an orchard spider right out of its nest or its web and started chomping it up. So again, soft body, don't have a lot of defenses. Uh, this wasp larva, this grub wasp larva is on the side of the spider. Spiders cannot pull that off. They can't even turn their head to look at it. And so all they can do is just sit there and have this little wasp larva suck it dry. So imagine if you had something stuck to you and it was feeding on you and you couldn't do anything about it. It's pretty terrifying. And of course, spiders eat other spiders. So it's lots of them out there eating each other. In fact, some are specialists on other spiders. So spiders have a hard life. I would say don't make it harder for them. Don't be super afraid of them. Don't crush them. Don't kill them for no reason. Because they are organisms in their own right. And they are pretty cool. And uh, they're really interesting organisms. And I, I definitely suggest more people observe them and get close to them and, and see them. Because you'll realize they're not kind of dangerous, bloodthirsty killers or anything like that. Okay, and now I'll open up for questions. And I think I saw a question. Oh, Say, yeah, that was fabulous, by the way. Yeah, go ahead oh. and you can read the question that uh, that you've got there while I turn. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so I think maybe why do some jumping spiders wave their legs in front of the air? Uh, I think it's partly to prepare for a jump. So they need to put their legs up so that when they hit the surface that they're jumping to, they're ready to grab it. Um, it may be because they also, you know, when they're climbing, they kind of reach out and, and grab things. But they're very aware and very, very charismatic uh, spiders. They, they, they like, they'll look at you and they'll notice you. 
Uh, and uh, but again, they're not going to jump on you and eat you or anything. So uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Oh, and one thing I need to note: uh, we were talking about um, the beginning. Uh, you you were saying about the new spider in North Carolina, right? So I'll stop sharing this. So I forgot to to uh, mention this, but I'll uh, I'll share my. Uh, where is it? Go? Where to go? Um, I want to. Well, let me share. I got while you're looking for that picture. I really want to thank you. That was fantastic. I know oh. that everyone here was uh, enthralled with it. Um, I got to tell you, you know, it's it's always interesting. Uh, other than the word spider, you said one other thing probably just as many times, and that is uh, harmless, harmless. This one's harmless. That one's harmless. Harmless, harmless, harmless. And it's so funny how we have an innate uh, fear of uh, snakes and spiders. Those are like the two top things mm -hmm. that I get people to like, you know, kind of get the chills from, right? The hairs on their arms stand up or the back of their neck. Uh, so it's interesting how often you said the word harmless and you went through, I don't know what, like 40 spiders here this evening, which so, by the way, thank you very much. The pictures are fantastic as well. Oh, thanks. But yeah, this, this is the, this is the spider that I, I had mentioned to you. So I'm glad that you pulled it up. The Joros. Yeah. So yeah. And the reason I say harmless is because I want to drill it down that basically, even if a spider would bite you, I've, I've been bitten by a spider. I can count on my one hand once I I've been bitten once ever. It was me as a kid throwing a wolf spider into a, a bucket of water, messing around with it because I liked spiders when I was younger. And I grabbed it out of the water and it bit my hand. And of course, I'm at fault. And I'm that type of person that even though I got bit by a spider, I've never stopped loving spiders. And they just don't bite randomly. People say when they wake up and they got a red welt on them, they think it's spider bite. Spider bite is is problematic because it's always synonymous with any mysterious bite. But spiders aren't just out there randomly biting people. Uh, also, spider bites, even if they do bite you, they're either like a tiny mild sting to a bee sting, but rarely are they important or dangerous. And so, and it's the same with snakes. I feel the same way about snakes. I love snakes. Um, there are some actually dangerous snakes, of course, that, that can kill you. But even then, spider, the spiders, it's funny because everybody's afraid of brown recluses, but nobody talks about black widows because they're just like, oh, yeah, they just live in North Carolina. Nobody cares. And they're, I'd much rather be bitten by a Putting brown recluse than black widow because it's so painful but they're just really not apt to bite not you know not many people have that experience luckily and you know they they need to protect themselves and things like that so i just try and drill home that that's the that's what's going on and it's even more so for these large spiders so these large spiders this joro spider is new uh it is about the size of your hand really beautiful uh bluish gray and yellow striped spider it is native to asia and has been established in uh it got established in georgia a few years ago and now it's spreading now it is an orb weaver so you don't see the large ones until the late summer and early fall and we have had some records in north carolina but again it's a harmless spider uh, and funny thing is, we actually have a close relative native in North Carolina. So if you go to the beach and you see what some people call banana spiders, they're actually called golden silk spiders. This is the cousin, our North American cousin of them. They get about the same size. They're huge spiders, but nobody cares about them. Nobody's freaking out about them. Uh, they are, they're really, really nice looking spiders. They get these little tufts. Um, and so if you're near the coast, you're probably going to see these. You don't confuse them for the Joro spiders, which uh, are more, are more, like I said, they have a much more bold, like striped pattern. But you can see how large these spiders can get. Uh, you can see why people will be afraid of them. But there's a really interesting thing. Uh, these women in Madagascar are made actually a textile out of the silk from a relative of these. As these little old women... They just grab the spiders right out of the web and just hold them and then get their silk and then put them back and everything. They don't care about it either. So you should not worry about these either. These are these are scary looking, but they're completely harmless. Um, and you can see people hold them and everything. They're not going to hurt you. Uh, I wouldn't go holding spiders just, you know, because there's always a chance and you want to avoid that. And then I don't want people blaming the spider. But basically you're really not going to have any problems with these spiders, but we are wondering what the ecological impact of these spiders is going to be. So that's, that's one of the, the ongoing bits of research. 
So is there a citizen science? Uh, did I read something about, uh, you know, don't harm these spiders, but report them just so uh, folks can uh, track their, their, their spread? Definitely. Yeah. So I would, if you find them, take a photo and up, upload them to iNaturalist. Uh, that's the best one uh, site or a bug guide. One of those online uh, libraries uh, that then can, people can see the records. There are some projects going around. I think some people at Clemson are doing projects on them. Uh, and the funny thing about this spider is uh, it's kind of more cold tolerant than other silk spiders. Like I said, the, the our native one is down near the southeastern part of the state, subtropical areas that are really common in Florida. This species, though, is now in the kind of Piedmont and the mountainous areas. And the records we have from North Carolina are actually from the Charlotte area and that area anyway. So kind of like out a little bit more western part. So uh, we suspect that they will survive for years and they're probably going to be they're they're established. We're they're, we're never getting rid of this spider. Basically, uh, I, it should start to become more common in North Carolina, but we're only going to see it for short periods of time in this in the year when they're at the biggest. Otherwise, you're not even going to notice them. Hey, you know, they look very similar to our uh, you know our writing spider. Our our, our what is it? Uh, uh, black and gold um, traditional yep. Charlotte's Web mm -hmm. spider, right? Yep. And actually, they're not much bigger. The biggest ones of those are, are rival the size of these, of course. So, and if you're not afraid of those spiders, you don't have to be afraid of these spiders. Now, these spiders do make very large webs that can be 10 feet wide, and they're very strong silk, too. But, um, but again, you shouldn't be any more afraid of this spider than you are of one of those big garden spiders. Again, they're basically blind. Uh, they can't, they're not really, they're not agile. They don't jump. They sit in a web and they're really good at sitting in a web and catching prey in a web. But otherwise they're, they're kind of clumsy and harmless. And you can see all these people holding them. So obviously no, <laughs> people aren't that afraid of them or whatever. So their web doesn't look like they put that extra silk in the middle like our um, writing spiders. No, they don't do those. Yeah, that that's actually really that's uh, that structure is called a stabilimentarium, and that's uh, they think that what that does is reflect UV light and help predators avoid, uh, like birds avoid flying into the webs and things like that. There, there, you know, people have hypothesized about the different functions of those writing the zigzags in those webs, um, but uh, a lot of those argiope, those 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 uh, those garden spiders have those, but this group doesn't. This group though has. Uh, uh, silk that's golden in color so in certain lights it'll be golden and it's very thick and strong in fact i'll find that uh if we have any other questions i'll find the uh the tapestry that was really cool yeah, that's pretty wild uh, that that silk is so strong that they're making textiles out of them um, well so they made this one and you can see here's the old woman old madagascar woman holding these giant spiders and everything and they they don't care. They're not as, at all afraid of them. But they made this nine foot tapestry. It took over a million spiders to make this one, and it's not economically feasible. I'll tell you that much. But you can see how golden that is. That's the natural color of the silk when they've weaved it. So it's this beautiful, strong tapestry. But it's like one of a kind. They're never going to make another one because it's just it's just one of those things. It's it's it was more for kind of uh, you know for curiosity's sake. But you can see how beautiful that is. Wow, that's that is amazing. I wonder who who uh, funded that uh, endeavor, right? Yeah, it's it's a really cool. I'm glad they did because it's such an interesting product. So, okay, yeah, no, so what, yeah, let's let's get some other questions. Donna, you have a question. Um, one of my questions is about the the um, the spiders that come in, like they come in off of bananas. You know, come in with other products. Do they do they just let those spiders be, or do they do do they kill them? I mean, do we want you know this? You know, like obviously the store spiders come in, but do we want spiders from other countries, you know, from other parts of the world, you know, coming in? to our continent? So, the, are yeah. you were you able to hear that? Uh, at yeah, all? yeah, I heard that. Um, okay. So yeah, we definitely don't want non-native spiders in the U.S., but there are plenty of non-native spiders. Uh, luckily, because they're predators and they're not like eating crops or things like that, they're not super, uh, you know, they're not as dangerous to the environment, although they do compete with native species. So that's one of the issues. Um, I would say if you get some kind of spider on, a, you know, bananas or something coming in from another country, I would catch it 
and have us identify it and see what it is. Now, most spiders that uh, come in like that probably cannot survive in North Carolina, especially the winters. Uh, they're going to die out. That's why we don't have all the invasive species that we could. Uh, but some spiders will survive fine. Uh, the other thing is that some of the non-native ones are already here. So even if you were to get it in, it's something that's found worldwide because it's just everywhere. That's um, encouraging. To, that's encouraging to hear that we don't um, just have literally all the world's um, invasive. Our, our weather does take care of some of it for us. Yeah, some. Now, if you live in Florida, they get all the crazy stuff because it survives there year round. So um, I did see a question. Do we have a close up of spider feet? I don't, but they are adorable. I can look that up um, because it is really cool looking. They're very, um, I don't know what I'm going to get with the search, but yeah, you can see spiders have claws and they have pads, like these fuzzy pads. But there's some really famous photos of uh, tarantula feet and they're very cute. They're very fuzzy looking. So yes, and and here's the pink toes. These uh, this is a pink toe uh, tarantula, and obviously that's why it's called that. But yeah, spiders have all different weird claws on their feet, uh, little little uh, kind of uh, pads made of tufts of fur. Uh, yeah, very specialized. Of course, certain ones use it to to traverse webs. Others are just using it to crawl on the ground or up glass or something like that. So on the same spider, they'll have different um, different of their legs. They'll have different patterns of, of hairs and, and whatnot on each of their feet. So typically within one spider, they'll, they'll have, um, and actually this is funny because this is a diagram showing some different spiders. Uh, different species of spiders will have different, they're usually the same on all feet, although they do have certain structures. So for instance, cobweb spiders, they get really, they make really fluffy silk because they have this uh, comb, this row, this comb of hairs on the underside of their, their legs, their hind legs that they can use to kind of uh, make the silk a certain way. Uh, and so that's actually how you identify those spiders is by that row of comb, these, these kind of comb-like CD on there. So the, but the spider's legs can be specialized. Some have longer legs than others, like those crab spiders. Um, but yeah. Neat. Yeah, I never knew that. It's fantastic. Lynn, you have a question? Yeah, I grew up on a dairy farm in Northeast Ohio, and we have a spider we always call it Granddaddy Longlegs. And I think it's the one you showed in your slides. It had long legs, it was a tiny body. Were you, you able to hear him? That? Yeah, let's see. Let, let me pull my talk and see if I can. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, I was expecting you to, to talk about Daddy Longlegs. Um, yeah, so well, I didn't, I didn't talk about daddy long legs or harvestmen. Yeah, because they're not a true spider, technically. So we could have talked about all different arachnids. Uh, but are you talking about kind of, so there, there's a couple of things that are called daddy long legs. So cellar spiders are often called daddy long legs. They have really long, thin legs. Uh, but they have two parts of their body. So their abdomen or their, it's called the uh, opisthosoma and the prosoma, the head area. Uh, but when we talk about um, daddy long legs or harvestmen, those are going to be, um, let's see, uh, let me see if I can find some of my photos. Um, so basically, um, so these are what are daddy long legs, what I consider daddy long legs too. These are harvestmen. These are the kind of ball with the legs. These are yeah. not spiders, technically. These are, uh, they're called opiliones. They're, they're a completely different group. They only have one body section and it's divided. Uh, and every, they have these really gangly legs, but there are actually, we have some tropical species here in North Carolina as well that have much thicker legs. Um, and these are native as well, but most of them are kind of this ball with hair-like legs. And that is not a true spider. They don't have venom. Uh, there is a myth about them being the most dangerous spiders out there, or dangerous, whatever, but they can't bite. That's completely untrue. They have uh, mouth parts that kind of pull apart prey or, or items. They're mostly scavengers, but they'll hunt like weak prey. Uh, but they're harmless, completely harmless, uh, really common in, uh, in North Carolina, just everywhere, uh, you know. So if you see that ball with the legs, that's going to be a harvestman or a, or a, or a day long legs in that respect. Uh, but it's not a true spider. And again, uh, but, those things are those things are harmless. I remember as a kid playing with those all the time. So they're harmless. Yes, well. completely harmless. Way more. 
I would say way more harmless than spiders because they don't even have venom. They can't even, you'll never get bitten by or hurt, hurt by one of them. Uh, some of them have like probably taste bad or could be poisonous maybe, like could have toxins, but they're not, They're if you're not eating it, you're not going to get hurt by one of these. So you never ate any of those, Len, did you? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, and 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 what was she talking about? Was she talking about this type or the other one that I was showing? Yeah, the other kind. Okay, yeah, yeah. So those we call cellar spiders, but also daddy long legs. In uh, Britain, they actually call crane flies daddy long legs. So that's the problem with common names. That's why we use scientific names, actually. So, yeah. Right. That's fabulous. Any other questions tonight? Yes. Yeah. Is that the silky one that the are you talking about the are you talking about the regular spiders or the the, the spitting spider yes so, yeah that question i didn't hear sorry so the question is that uh, of these spiders that are making webs, um, do they uh, do they come out of the mouth? How is it so strong? I know that earlier you said the one actually the spitting spiders have it where they come out of their abdomen as well as their uh, their mouth. But these web, how how is it that it's so strong? But it does come out of yeah. their abdomen, right? Yes, yes. All spiders have what are called spinnerets. They're like leg like structures. Uh, they could be different shape, a different number and things like that, that are on the abdomen, the tip of the abdomen. And what happens is they have these silk glands inside the body uh, that have a liquid in them. And when that liquid is uh, pushed out of some spigots and pulled by the legs, the, it's a protein. And what happens is depending on the spigot and the leg type and things like that, when it pulls it out, it's kind of like taffy, like it pulls it out of the, as a liquid and it starts to dry and, and form chains. And that's how it becomes really strong. And there's all different research on different types of spider silk. They produce, I think up to nine different types of silk, not all in one spider, but, um, you know, can produce all different types of silk from different spigots and different glands and things like that. And so, um, they can produce the ones with little sticky drops on them. They can produce just structural ones. Uh, even in a single web, you could have a few different types. Uh, and it's basically, like I said, liquid that's pulled out and makes like kind of like, it's almost like silly string or like taffy. It's like you pull it real tight and it, and it arranges the protein, the, the, the chain in a certain way that makes it this really, really flexible, but really strong substance. In fact, it's supposedly the strongest substance, uh, biological substance known, or at least, you know, as far as stretching and things like that, um, you know, uh, it's like hundreds of times stronger than, uh, than steel that's, that's pulled that thin, you know? So that's why when we walk into a web, we can actually feel it and it kind of tugs on us and stuff like that. It's, they have very strong webs um, and for good reason, obviously. And many spiders also make a new web each night and also eat their webbing, their silk afterward to recoup that that nutrition and that those proteins and stuff. So yeah. Well, we've all gone hiking early, and uh, you know when you're the first one on the trail, that's for sure. Um, you, you I will say, even though I love spiders, I don't like getting silk all over me, or I don't. I will freak out if something lands on my. Well, beard hair. I don't have hair hair, uh, you know, and uh, and if there's some unknown critter that falls on me, of course, I'm going to freak out a little bit. But if you stay calm, the thing is going to the thing's freaking out to you. Just, you know, let it go. Drop it off your body. You know, it'll go running and tell its family how horrible you were and all that stuff. So. Indeed. All right. We have one more question. Great. Do spiders have spiracles on their abdomen like insects do? Oh, that's a good question. I, I heard that. Uh, they don't have spiracles like insects, uh, but they do have, uh, they have things called book lungs. So they have little slits in their, on, on the underside of their abdomen that lead into kind of, it's almost like gills, like they're these stacks, that's why they're called book lungs, these stacks of membranes that then they breathe in and, uh, and uh, respirate and, and that's where the gas exchange happens. So they basically only have that, that set of book lungs. I want to say most spiders only have a pair and then tarantulas and things like that will have uh, two pairs of book lungs. Um, but yeah, that's how they breathe. Um, and, uh, and otherwise, yeah, that's, that's how they do it. And they can actually close them up 
and they can actually survive a long time without oxygen. Uh, and they're really hardy for being such kind of weak organisms as far as like structurally weak, they're kind of soft and baggy and stuff like that. They, uh, they can live a long time without food. Some spiders can live over a year easily without food. Um, and without water. So that's why they're also found in a lot of different habitats and why they're really successful is that they're tough physiologically, even though they're not kind of, they're kind of weak, weak a little bit, uh, you know, structurally. That's fabulous. I got to tell you, it's, uh, it's exciting to uh, learn all these things, it's certainly for me and I know for, for our uh, attendees. So thank you very much, Matt. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time tonight. And, Great. Uh, and we'll give you a little wrap of applause. <laughs> Great, thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. I always enjoy talking about spiders because they're they're a lot uh, very mysterious to people and obviously misunderstood. So, yeah, yeah. And and thanks for letting us know. I mean, uh, we'll look forward to when uh, NC State goes ahead and puts together some tapestry out of some of these webs too. Let us know about that. Yeah, you all can start it first if you want. And you know, I'll I'll, I'll let you know how you're doing. But I don't know about our local spiders, but who knows. <laughs> well hey thanks again i appreciate it thanks for coming out tonight and you guys uh, everybody online uh and uh watching us on youtube uh in the future uh thanks for uh, for watching and learning we'll look forward to it thanks yeah. so much all right everyone have a good night take care good night good night everybody <laughs>